Good morning. Uh, good morning. Thank you. Welcome to The Journey. So glad that you're here. I'm Pastor Michael Charbo. Thanks for being in worship today. Uh, if this is your very first time, The Journey, welcome. Uh, we don't pass out third grade Bibles every Sunday, but you came on a very special Sunday where we got to do this. And it's just so exciting about this uh, special occasion, this sort of marking of a next chapter, if you will, of, uh, of our children in ministry's life as they continue to move forward, make their way to our youth ministry and confirmation. And so what an exciting day. Thank you for playing a role uh, in all of of this chapter. Uh, as you saw, we're starting a brand new sermon series right now called The Calling. It's a three-week series on the book of Philippians, and we're going to look at Paul's writing to this early church and see what sort of wisdom he brings about to them to talk about their calling. They're, we're all called in ministry to respond to what God is moving in our life. The common thing is, oh, preachers are called. You know, missionaries are definitely called. They go all, we're all called. So we're going to get this language of calling more familiar and comfortable with all of us. I think Philippians does a great job of that. Now listen, friends, third graders, if you're flipping through, you're going to find Philippians in the New Testament. You've got the Old Testament, you've got the New Testament, and you're going to find Philippians is going to be after the book of Ephesians, nearing the very end, and before the book of Colossians. Okay, after Ephesians, before Colossians. Now, Pastor Michael, a few weeks ago, couldn't find 1 Kings in the Bible, and all of your parents laughed at me. So, uh, remember, you have something called a table of contents at the very beginning where you can find out what page it's on. And I, I'm telling you, the emails I got after that sermon, they're like, we're still rooting for you, Michael. You can, you can find that book in the Bible next time. So, I feel the love there. So, we're going to turn to Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1, we're going to read verses 27 through 30. Listen to these, wall, these words Paul writes to the church there in Philippi, which is why they're called Philippians. Here we go. And you can follow the words along on the screen, right? On the screen. Here we go. Whatever happens, Paul writes, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then... Whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ not only to believe on him, but also to suffer for him, since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had, and now hear that I still have. Friends, this is the word of God for us, the people of God, and together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. And amen. I was in Chicago this past week uh, for a wedding. I love Chicago. Y'all know that. It's one of my favorite cities where I went to seminary years ago. It was awesome. It was in the Gold Coast neighborhood, tucked away amidst the <clears throat> Blackstone, or Brownstone, excuse me, Brownstone uh, homes there. These like thin, tall homes, beautiful, right along the edge of Lake Michigan. I went for a morning run one morning and it was 58 degrees, but you would have hated it. I'm telling you. It's a balmy 58. You would have really hated it. You would have loved it. Okay. Um, Leslie was a bridesmaid, and um, she, so we did all kind of the festivities before and then went to the rehearsal dinner, and I found myself with a lot of the bridesmaids' husbands and boyfriends. And you know, that's always kind of an awkward time. Maybe you've been one of those, uh, your spouse in the wedding. Like, you're talking to these people, and you know you're not going to have a long, this might be the last time you see these people, but you're like, we're in this hour-long thing together. <laughs> Let's do it. You know what I'm talking about, if you know. Um, and so I was in, in, talking with one of the bridesmaids' uh, boyfriends who actually happened to be on the Chicago Fire MLS professional soccer team. He's currently injured, so he didn't travel with the team who was in Montreal for the weekend, if you're keeping tabs on that team. Uh, but even though he was injured, this dude was a beast. I mean, he was a professional soccer player. This is a big dude. Uh, he was moved over from the UK not long ago and is now playing his American dream here on a soccer team. And I looked at him and I said, I totally get what you're going through. I've seen Ted Lasso. I know your story. 
It was a joke. Uh, he laughed, thankfully, so we got to keep on talking. The conversation really picked up when we started going on about his athletic story of how he got to where he was. You see, his family put him into soccer at a very early age and was kind of crafting him to be this soccer player. Everything he did, everything he even ate was all in the goal of making him strong and more mature. And what he would say to me in, one, in a part of our conversation, we talked for a while, is that what kept him sane was knowing that he wasn't doing it by himself. Like if he said, if I was doing, say, tennis, like solo tennis, I don't know if I would have made it through. The fact that I was like grinding it out, doing all the work, I had the stamina and to follow through. He made a side comment to me. The guy talked a lot, which was great uh, on my end. I just kind of listened to him. But he said this little side comment that stuck out to me. I thought I would share it with you this morning. He said, wherever you get people focused and unified, you have a very powerful group of people. Focused and unified. You might be asking me, why are you saying this today? Like, what does this have to do with anything, Jarbo? And I think that those two words, focused and unified, is actually what it means to be called to something. That's what the book of Philippians is all about. Paul, who is writing this small, bustling church plant in the town of Philippi, has fallen in love with Jesus Christ. And he tells them, hey, you are all partakers in this grace with me. You are all in the fellowship with me because you love him. And I know you love him. I know you are team Jesus. And I can tell that you're focused on that reality of being attuned to Jesus. But there's one thing I'm catching. There's one thing you're picking up. You're not very unified. You have trouble getting along. And I know what you're thinking. Jarbo, Christians who don't get along, that doesn't make any sense. Oh, yeah, it's good. It's not hard to imagine, is it, friends? Right? Do denominations battling within one another. In fact, why do denominations become things, right? Conflict, battling. Churches have strife from within. And I'll be honest, I struggle it with it too sometimes on my own. Someone tells me what church they go to at a coffee shop that I'm talking at, and I think, oh, that's such a nice place. Mm -hmm, cool. Or they talk about their worship leader, and they're like, oh, I love, but she, they're, they're so good. And I'm like, I'm sure they are, but deep down I'm thinking, they're no Kimball Witt. Uh-uh, not here. Or someone who joins this church tells me what church they're coming from, and I'm like, oh, bless your heart. Oh, God, I'm so glad you got here as quick as you could. That's wonderful. I think that. I don't say that out loud, of course. I would never say that out loud. Why do we do this? Why? Competition, right? There's this uh, underlying, it's this place of, of, of uh, 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 disunity between us. I have a friend uh, back in Dallas where I grew up. And uh, he part-time is a ref at a softball complex. And uh, we were meeting up last time I was in Dallas, and he told me that all the refs at the softball complex hate refing for the Christian Softball League. He says there's more cussing and more fighting in the Christian League than there ever is in the beer leagues that come through and play. That's sad. Yeah, it's sad. They go to war against each other. And we do this too, don't we? Fellow church members, we come in here on Sunday, we got our donuts and our cold brew, and we're like, hey, what's going on? It's cool on Sunday morning. But then outside of it, you said, like, did you hear what she said at the PTA meeting? Ooh. Or what sign they put in their front yard for election season, which is coming up, by the way. Or did you see what he wore to the Stratford game? Ooh. All doing it, while they've got MDMC and Journey t-shirts in their closet. And yet, we are called to love one another. And not only do we have to love one another, but the Bible says that all these third graders got is that you can't look like Christ without them. Ephesians 4 goes on to say this. I love this line. Some have been called to be apostles. Some have been called to be prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach what? Unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God. You can't look like 
Jesus if you hate the person next door to you. You can't look like Christ if you have a struggle with her over and over and over again. God's rigged it that way. That our spirituality is always worked out in the complexity of unity. Christ's likeness is unattainable individually. Can I say that again? Christ's likeness is unattainable by yourself. And so here's my fear is that us here at MDUMC, we are going to church regularly. We're trying to maybe even get involved in this study if we make time for it. We see a bunch of third graders get their Bibles and we're like, ooh, we gotta probably dust ours off from back in the day. But what we desperately have to keep coming back to is this understanding of unity. We will be ineffective in our mission of making disciples for Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world if we don't have unity. And so in this first chapter of Philippians, 12 times the Bible talks, uh, Paul talks in the Bible about this idea of the glory of God. And then when he turns and looks right directly at the Philippians, you can tell the, the writing sort of changes. He begins to talk about pursuing unity. Let's read verse 27 again. I, I like how the NRSV translation states it. It says, only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. The theologian Karl Barth says it this way. It's as if Paul lifts up only one finger and says, I want you to do one thing, right? The first word, only, only one thing I want you to do. Now, there's something interesting to catch about this phrase. Uh, the phrase, live your life in the manner of, live your life in the manner of, in, in verse 27, is only one word in the Greek. So check this out, third graders. The New Testament was first written in Greek. The Old Testament was first written in Hebrew. So you have to kind of go back to that early language a long time ago, right? And it's this word called polatulase, polatulase. And it's built on the Greek word polis, which translate to city. Why we say metropolis, city, right? And so a very basic translation of the word politulase is to exhibit your duties as a citizen. And so what's interesting about this, why commentators pick this word up is because Paul doesn't use the word politulase anywhere else but here for the Philippians. He only uses it to describe them, which makes people think he must have known something about them. Because back then, your polis, your city, was everything. You were unapologetically associated with your city, more than what football team you like on Saturdays or Sundays, more than what you do for a living, more than what team your kid plays for in the local leagues. Your city defines your character, your identity. One writer said, a man without a city is not a man at all. You were identified by your polis, by your city. And Paul knew the Philippians loved their city. A little bit more history. We're going to be in Philippians for a few weeks, so let me just kind of unpack this for you. In the year 42 BC, right, uh, or before Common Era, before Christ, the armies of Octavian and Antony overthrew the armies of Brutus and Cassius. Remember Brutus? Remember? <laughs> Oh, et tu, Brute? Yeah, that's, uh, that's the same thing. It really happened. That's Brutus. Antony's forces were victorious over Brutus, and they were, he was so proud of what his soldiers went on and did that he gave them a military colony called Philippi and gave them also Roman citizenship, which came with a ton of perks, one of which being you don't have to pay taxes. And so when you were a Philippian, you were proud to be a Philippian. So when someone said politulase, like you're a citizen of Philippi, you'd kind of be like, oh yeah, that's me. Something would kind of like bolster out of you. It would be like if someone in this room was like, uh, or my, myself, I looked out and said, is anyone in this room a cowboy? Cowboy, is there anyone in here? If, if, if you identified as a cowboy, you probably would say something like, oh yeah, that's me. And you might, you know, Show me your belt buckle, tip your hat, say, I own 30 head of cattle. 
That's what cowboys say, right? Mark, is that what cowboys say? Um, something like that. Right? You embody those characteristics. Uh, if, if I say, is anyone in this room a lacrosse player? You'd probably be like, sup, bro? Live, love, lax, baby. You kind of like flex your traps a little bit just right here. You'd show off your lacrosse stick because lacrosse players always have a lacrosse stick on them, it feels like. Lacrosse players I know also have at least like some kind of Euro mullet. So they wave that baby in the air, right? That's like, yeah, yeah that's right. It's like, like lacrosse. Like that's, that's what you identify as. It's who you are. If I say, is anyone in this room in a band, right? And there's, there's some band members here, right? You wouldn't flex. You'd just be like, what's up? What's up? Yeah, you, you, you're cool. Like, um, like uh, you wouldn't say like, I'm in a band, I play the bass. No, no, ba- band, band folks, people in the band are cool. It's like, I, I factually know that I will never be as cool as Eris, our guitar player in our band. It's just the gospel of Jesus Christ. Right? I will not be as cool as Eris in our band. You, you, when you, but you, if you're a part of this, you just instantly and naturally take on the characteristics and identity that you're proud to be associated with. And so let me explain why I'm saying all this. So when Paul looks at the the Philippians and says, pull a tulise, there's a big feeling. They start to think about the place that they're proud of, that was fought for them, that was bought for them, their identity that was bought for them. They they would have said, I want to take on the characteristics of that kind of bravery, that kind of courage, that kind of strength. But when Paul is saying, pull a tulise in verse 27, He's not talking about being a Philippian. He's talking about being a, a, a co-heir of the gospel of Christ. He says, because your polis is in heaven, not here on earth. He says that in, verse three, in chapter 3. We'll read that in a few weeks. He says, you, you serve a different king, a different kind of warrior who has fought hell and won it for you that secured a city for you, that's, that secured a, a, a space for you to be who you are, a family called the church, a secured an us for you. And so Paul says, I, I want you to live in a way that's worthy of the kind of king that you're supposed to serve. And you take on his identity. You become more like him. And Paul says, when we can put that on, we can put the glasses of, of that sort of mindset on and live out of a lens of unity. He wraps up verse 27 by saying this, whether I come and and see you or I'm absent and hear about you, I know that you will be standing firm in one spirit. We need to be united, friends, so that we can stand. The word stand or standing makes me think of like the depiction of a beautiful tree, you know? Trees got roots, offers resistance against that which wants to try to bring it down, albeit the weather or anything else. Home ownership uh, makes me think, it's not for the birds, friend. It's a new owner of a home. Big branch fell a week or two uh, ago and missed my house by just this much. Again, second time that sort of happened. My neighbor was walking his dog outside and said, heard you're a minister. Guess why? Guess that's why I missed the house. I was like, huh, whatever works. <laughs> Leslie was like, shut up, Michael. Don't say that to them. Just trying, right? I just, whatever works. But check this out, friends. The branch from that tree, it didn't fall because of a storm. It fell because it was dry outside. But here's the truth. I can't fix a storm coming my way or my house's way or my tree's way. I can't fix it being dry outside completely. But what probably happened, why the branch probably fell, was because one of the owners didn't water the tree very well. And so this beautiful tree that had this beautiful branch is now laying dead in my yard. Let me ask you, friends, how many of you look as if your tree of your faith is rooted, is planted, dare I say, is even beautiful, but the truth is you haven't watered it for a while. I think there's a lot of beautiful trees one step away from their branches falling here in the memorial area. And many of us will inevitably, and let me get real, 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 real quick. Many of us 
We won't even realize the branch is about to come crashing down because we think we can water it all on our own. And I'm here to tell you, friends, it doesn't matter how much education that you have, how much money you have in your bank account, how much you've read your holy Bibles, you cannot do your faith on your own. And most of the times we find this out once the branches hit the ground, once the, 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 the floor has fallen out, once it's all exploded. But the truth is it began in those secret quiet places alone in your room. Let me ask you, friends, is lust tearing you apart from the inside out when you're alone? Do you feel like loneliness sort of stalks you whenever you're by yourself? Do you feel that sense of unworthiness? Like that sense that like, I don't have it together and I live here in this area I think people know it, but I'm going to keep fastening this mask a little tighter so it looks like I belong. I'm really good at making it new once in a while, dusting it off. Or are all three of those things sort of combining together and it's opening the doors for you to make more and more selfish decisions? Friends, we are being de in our own backyard. Why? Because we think we can do it on our own. And I know what, you're, you're, you, things are going in your life, you don't tell anybody. You say, no one's going to understand. Can I tell you that's the phrase I hear most from people whose branches have already fallen? <laughs> Nobody's going to understand. If you're already saying that, things are falling apart. Because when you run, you run by yourself. You run alone. And when you're running alone, you begin to get worn out. And here's an equation I want you all to sort of memorize here, is that weariness plus isolation equals failure. And some of you in this room, I think all of us to some degree, live in that math problem, rinse and repeat. A lot. Weariness, isolation. Weariness, isolation. And the only way to break that cycle is to accept the reality that you can't do it alone. And here's my point today, is that for many of you in this room, the most Christian thing that you can do when you leave here (laughs) is to pray and ask God to show you a brother or sister that can stand with you and help show you your roots again. And when I say stand with you, I don't mean necessarily your boyfriend or girlfriend or your spouse. I mean a couple of dear friends. You know who they are. Or maybe you don't know who they are and you're gonna pray to God and say, who are they? Some people that are close to your life in a similar age and stage, if you can, that can remind you that your polis is unified in Christ. Because there is a difference between perceived holiness and personal holiness. It's a real thing. Living a perceived holiness works for a couple days, but then when times get difficult, that's when the branches fall off. And when a soul is not with a center, you become vulnerable to every situation and circumstance. So on the flip side of perceived holiness is personal holiness. And however, it sounds like you have to do it by yourself, personal holiness thrives when you're doing it with other people, when you're caring for it. Personal holiness invites you to look at your roots, name that you've failed watering them to someone you trust, and then start leaning in and caring for them on a regular basis. I'll admit, I'm in a group of friends, four dudes in ministry, who I can share all my stuff with, the stuff I don't want anyone else to know. And I was skeptical at first. And so when I went and met with the group, I was like, I'll I'll go last. I'll go last. I don't want to go first. And they kind of like smiled and laughed. They'd already kind of been meeting. And I was amazed at how open they were with one another. And And when the person was done telling and talking, guess what? No one said, dude, you're messed up. The next person raised their hand and said, I guess I'll go next. Personal holiness thrives in unity. One last image to share with you. Soccer, again, 
When I think about soccer, I also think about this show I love called Welcome to Wrexham. It's uh, an incredible show, story of Ryan Reynolds and uh, Rob McElhaney, who purchased this old rundown soccer team in Wales called Wrexham FC. It has some beautiful storylines. It's worth watching. It's a great show whether you like sports or not. And on this newest season, it talks about their lead striker. His name is Paul Mullins. Uh, he's their lead scorer. He is a four-year-old who has uh, a disability, um, and he's pretty open about that disability, which is a hard thing to do, especially when you are a professional athlete, to share and be open about this. But his openness, his caring of this moment, helped to spring forward this other gal named Millie, a ninth grader in the local high school, who was able to share about her disability openly. And the two of them together, two unlikely people, came together and they're helping to spread about this issue of disability and struggles with that beautifully to all this community and even all to Wales to help bring awareness and care to the community. In an episode recently, Millie was interviewed and she said this phrase, another kind of drop away line, but I thought it was so poignant. She said this, what any of us have or are going through should never be seen as a disability. It should be seen as a superpower. Friends, Millie's preaching the gospel And I pray it's a word for us today to stay focused, yes, but focus combined with unity, unified in the reality that we are all broken in need for a savior can make us all the more powerful for the mission of Christ. May it be so. Amen.